Um, my name is Bob Musil. I'm the president of the Rachel Carson Council. I am also a board member of EESI, the Environmental and Energy Study Institute, and we're very happy to welcome you all here today. We have an outstanding panel on decommissioning nuclear power plants. Um, those of you in the room presumably know what they are, but one of the problems you will see, and we'll hear from a number of distinguished experts here, is that this is a problem that was anticipated certainly by the panelists I know, but the idea that we might be shutting down upwards of 80 nuclear power plants which are packed with highly radioactive materials, highly enriched uranium, mm -hmm. sit in local communities. It affects the economy, the health, and there is long-range planning that is lacking on what to do with these fuel rods and other materials. So what we're going to be doing is taking a look, first of all, at what is out there, where they are, why they're dangerous. Then we're going to take a look at some of the options for what to do with them, which range from on-site to long, moving them around. Um, our panelists will talk about that. And then we have folks from uh, Zion, Illinois, the mayor, uh, who are wrestling with the problems already of having a closed nuclear power plant in their community. And we also uh, have a leader of the Shoshone who will also be talking about some of the problems connected to Native Americans and their rights. Uh, well, before I introduce everyone, I'm going to start in one more quick announcement. You can get all of the materials for this briefing, the slides you will see, and other materials at the EESI website, www.eesi.org. For those of you who live tweet, uh, there we are at at EESI talk. And we're also very happy to be broadcasting on C-SPAN uh, this afternoon. And there will also be a webcast that will be available permanently on the website of EESI. So tell your friends. They can start tuning in. Or later on when we're done, you can get all these materials and an important topic. I want to begin then with laying out an overview and some of the problems <coughs> uh, with Mr. Robert Alvarez. Uh, Bob Alvarez is one of those who has been following nuclear power plants for a long time. He uh, is the former senior policy advisor and assistant secretary of energy and has many, many other credentials to be addressing these subjects. So I want to begin with Mr. Bob Alvarez, uh, formerly of the Department of Energy. Bob. I'm recovering from the Department of Energy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what I'm going to talk about here are mostly predisposal issues associated with uh, nuclear power plants. After about, s and especially the uh, the spent fuel aspect of it, which is really the most significant, long-lasting uh, problem facing the closure of power plants. You know, as you know. Nuclear power plants are no longer just about generating electricity. They've become major large-scale radioactive waste management operations. Uh, and after about 60 years, nuclear, the United States has generated roughly 30 percent of the total global inventory of spent nuclear fuel, by far the largest. Uh, there are about, about 80,150 metric tons at about 125 sites, 99 which are operational. Uh, why should we be concerned about this? As I've said, uh, because mainly because this is material which is considered some of the most hazardous material on the planet, and it is a unique material that is just sort of the something that was new, totally new and unthought about uh, until uh, about 19, the 1950s when the uh, United States government began to sort of ponder the subject of what do we do with these wastes. Um, in 1959, Abel Woolman, University professor at uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, testified before Congress the first time they, they inquired into the subject. He said, their toxicity in general terms, both radioactive and chemical, is greater by far than any industrial material which we have hereto dealt with in any other country. He said, we dispose of waste of almost every industry in the United States by actual conversion into harmless material 
Woolman stressed this is the first series of waste of any industry of that kind where this disposal is non-existent. Uh, spent fuel is, is essentially bound up in more than 244,000 long rectangular assemblies containing tens of millions of fuel rods. Uh, they in turn contain trillions of, of pellets about the size of a fingerprint. And they stay in a ra they get irradiated in a reactor core for about six years. And after that, about five to six percent of that <coughs> uranium is converted to highly radioactive material. Uh, that have half, that, uh, ranging from half lives of seconds to millions of years. Uh, because of this, uh, the, these extraordinary hazards, it's been long recognized that uh, that this fuel is should be disposed of or contained. Actually, disposal is not necessarily the appropriate term, but contained <coughs> for a period of time to, uh, of at least ten thousand to one hundred thousand years, which sort of it transcends the, uh, uh, the geologic epoch defining human civilization. Uh, this is a slide that was given to me by David Kraft, which I think is very useful about where, where the paths are right now. Uh, one thing that's key is the indefinite storage is, seems to be the likely commonality as opposed to uh, what will happen. Uh, as I said, there are major radioactive waste generators. Uh, they contain about 23 billion, cur billion curies of radioactivity. These are considered the largest concentrations of artificial radioactivity on the planet. And uh, the one way to compare that is how much radioactivity has been generated by the production of nuclear weapons in the United States. The radioactivity in their high-level waste is about 30 times less than what's been generated by commercial nuclear power plants. Uh, the amount of radioactive cesium, which is a very dangerous isotope, it's, uh, roughly 40 percent of the long-lived, longer-lived isotopes in spent fuel, is about 350 times more than was uh, released to the environment by all 600-plus atmospheric nuclear weapons tests in the spent fuel. There are about 700 metric tons of plutonium. Uh, the global inventory of plutonium right now is about 250 metric tons, so there's a lot of stuff in there. Right now, about 70 percent of the waste that has been generated by nuclear power plants in the form of spent fuel is sitting in pools, and it's densely compacted. The rest is in dry, dry cast storage. This is a graph giving you an idea of, of uh, reactors that are uh, this is somewhat dated because I think there are some additional reactors that should be added to this, but this gives you an idea of spent fuel at stranded, future standard reactors. Uh, we're looking at a, more than a quarter of the total spent fuel generated by nuclear power plants in this country now at stranded reactors, or soon to be stranded reactors. Um, this mic here, right? right? Okay. One of the major, we, we've talked a lot about the radioactive hazards of, uh, of uh, these wastes, but the other principal danger is that it gives off tremendous amounts of heat in the form of what's called decay heat, or thermal heat. Uh, if you pull a full core that's been irradiated for a few years out of a reactor uh, at, at the same time, it gives off enough decay heat to power a steel mill blast furnace. Uh, it's quite, it's quite uh, hot, and it's enough to cause the cladding of the spent fuel to catch fire, uh, as well as uh, even over time that heat remains a problem for about 1,200 years when you get in a geologic disposal. And the heat is so great it can actually de destabilize the disposal medium that it's present in, so you have to deal with the issues associated with decay heat. Uh, we got involved with this problem in 2002, 2003, following the 9-11 attacks. My colleagues and I put together a working group and, and uh, basically determined, uh, reported in a, a, a very scientific journal that uh, if somebody or some event were to cause the pools to drain in the pool and at nu U.S. nuclear power plants as they are currently uh, stuffed with spent fuel, that it would lead to a catastrophic release of radioactivity that would be far greater than a, than a meltdown. It would be far greater than Chernobyl. Um, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission hotly opposed what we had to say. The National Academy was called in to referee our dispute. They came out with findings in 2005, which the NRC attempted to suppress and rewrite. 
but they basically agreed with us that uh, you have to take this problem seriously. These spent fuel pools are holding about four to five times more spent fuel than their current designs allowed. And the uh, and because of that, uh, they, they, these spent fuel pools were never meant to hold the, that, this material longer than five years. Now they're holding them for decades, and they, they don't have the same type of safety uh, measures that a reactor has, like the secondary containment, the big dome. It doesn't have independent water supply. It doesn't have its own independent source of electricity. Uh, we pointed out that one of the big problems is a spent fuel pool fire. Uh, a couple years ago, my colleagues up updated their analysis and basically pointed out that if an accident were to occur at the Limerick reactor, involving a spent fuel pool fire, about eight million people would have to be evacuated because of the land contamination. And the damages could be, on the average, would be around two trillion dollars. Uh, this is far greater than Hurricane <laughs> Katrina. We're looking at something that would be brought about by a technological disaster that's be comparable to war. Uh, one of the problems with spent fuel is, is that is sort of unresolved is the fact that they are, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has been allowing the <coughs> uh, reactor operators to irradiate the fuel longer by increasing the amount of fissionable uranium-235 from about 3.5 to almost 5 percent in content. What this does is it builds up a great deal more radioactivity and fission products as well as, as, well as uh, fissile materials. And this stuff is very hot. And we do, the NRC does not have a technical basis to support the safe transfer of this material, and it's likely to be trapped at uh, reactor sites be until we figure out whether this stuff is, can be safely moved. What the, what the research is showing is that uh, the longer you ke keep this stuff in a reactor and irradiate it, the thinner the cladding becomes, the more likely it corrodes. It becomes very vulnerable to movement and vibrations, uh, and so, and there's no technical basis to in terms of information to tell you above the levels that they're burning up right now, whether it's safe for any long-term storage or movement. Uh, this gives you an idea of how much is high burn-up at uh, stranded reactors, roughly 23 percent, about 77 percent of it is lower burn-up. Um, there's a lot of effort to try to push for an uh, interim storage site to get it out of my backyard. Uh, hence, you have a lot of you know, legislative initiatives that have been promoted o over the last few years to do that. Uh, this is easier said than done because um, uh, we have a, a basic problem where transportation <coughs> infrastructures are at near reactor sites are variable and changing. Uh, each spent fuel canister system has unique challenges. Some of the dry casts out there are not suitable for transport. Uh, the pickup and transportation order hasn't been determined. And what you have is a, a steady growth of shutdowns and a buildup that's going to clog the system. Uh, so will the older stuff have priority? Well, what if the older stuff is further away? Uh, these are issues that have not been worked out. And again, the high burn-up material, uh, which gives off a lot of thermal heat, may r result in being trapped in sites for longer, much longer periods than we've been led to believe. It could have a major impact because uh, the transportation may, and, and certainly disposal, will certainly involve uh, repackaging of as, as many as 11,800 disposal canisters. Now, where is the money coming from? Under the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, uh, the, the users of nuclear generated electricity are levied a user fee of one mil per kilowatt hour and that is to pay for the search and the opening of a repository. It does not pay for the establishment of an interim storage site, the transport of that material to that site, the repackaging of the material for disposal. That is to be borne by the ratepayer at this time. Although there is legislation that's been offered that would allow the DOE to, to assume title for a, uh, a pilot program, but beware of that because that could turn into a down payment for a balloon mortgage. We don't really, we're looking at expenses, things that have not been costed out in an adequate fashion. <coughs> this is a rough graph. I'll, I'll give you a quiz on it when I'm done. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, to give you an idea of what it would cost maybe to uh, 
to store some of the stranded spent fuel. So it, it gets up to about $3.8 billion. And that's, this is DOE numbers. I'm, you know, they, DOE is, has a great record of, uh, of, uh, of miss, mi missing the target when it comes to cost inflation. Uh, repackaging is one of the big issues that has not been dealt with. When they shut the reactors down, they removed the infrastructure to allow for repackaging, which are the pools. So, and a lot of these dry casts cannot necessarily be opened uh, without some sort of infrastructure. Uh, DOE expects a repository to be open if, if, if the planets line up and Congress goes along with the licensing process for Yucca Mountain and everything. They have a river cutting ceremony. They'll uh, they'll they'll uh, come up. They'll be able to open a repository, but maybe by 2048, and then after that, it'll take about 50 years to fill the repository. Uh, and you basically are looking at perhaps the repackaging of 80,000 to 80,000 small canisters. Um, the costs DOE has been looking at this. But you're looking at maybe a billion dollars per reactor additional cost for repackaging. Uncertainties. I found this to be a very interesting quote. Uh, Indian Point Energy is hedging their best <coughs> when they issued their uh, decommissioning report. This report should not be taken as any indication until ICC knows how DOE will eventually perform its obligations or has any specific expectations confirming that performance. So these guys are essentially. Uh, on their own, trying to make things up as they go along. So the basic under pro approach undertaking this country for storage and disposal of spent fuel needs to be fundamentally revamped. We need to address the vulnerabilities of, of spent storage and spent fuel pools. I think they need to be rapidly thinned out. It'll take about 10 years. We estimate it would cost for between 3.5, 7 billion dollars to do that. That would greatly reduce your hazards, your consequences. Uh, and instead of waiting for problems to arise, which tends to be the, the, the modus operandi of the regulators and the government, they need to develop a transparent, comprehensive roadmap of what the problems are for the public to understand. How long will, what are we talking about in terms of interim storage? How long will it take? How much will it cost? Uh, otherwise, the United States will depend on these leaps of faith with regard to nuclear waste storage and leaps of faith as a stage for largely unfunded radioactive waste balloon mortgage payments in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob Alvarez. Uh, Bob, I should mention, is also a, is currently a senior scholar at the Institute for Policy Studies. And he, like all of our panelists, will be available for media interviews at the conclusion of this session. We also have reserved about a half hour for you to quiz our experts up here, and we'll save questions until all of the panelists are done. Uh, next, we have Kevin Camps. Kevin is a, uh, a nuclear waste specialist with the organization Beyond Nuclear. He also works with a number of other organizations and has been following these issues for a good deal of time. And he's going to talk about some of the difficulties with storage options and also about some alternatives. One, for those of you who remember Bonanza, the 20th century TV program called Hoss. <laughs> it's all yours. Kevin. Thank you, Bob. Um, there we go. Okay. So um, I apologize in advance. I'm going to have to skip some slides, but Bob's done a great job on the pool risks, for example. So I will fly through the images, but I'll try to hit some main points during my talk. One is that we oppose not only the current risky pool storage, but also the in inadequate dry cask storage. And that's why we're calling for hardened on-site storage, a significant safety upgrade and security upgrade to dry cask storage. We also oppose the Yucca Mountain dump and centralized interim storage and the unnecessary high-risk shipments through 44 states, many major cities, and 75% of U.S. congressional districts that are a part and parcel of that plan. And I'd like to start by um, pointing out that today, July 16th, is a day of infamy in New Mexico and nationwide because of the Trinity atomic bomb blast of 1945, the Church Rock uranium mine tailing spill of 1979, and incredibly now, in its tone deafness, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's announcement of the beginning of the licensing proceeding 
for the centralized interim storage facility targeted at Southeast New Mexico, Holtec, Eddie Lee Environmental Alliance. We have a September 14th legal intervention deadline, and believe you me, the environmental movement will show up for that deadline in opposition to this environmental injustice. And so, yes, empty the pools into dry cask storage, but as you'll see, we are calling for significant safety and security upgrades on the dry cask storage. So just to give you an idea, and Bob already touched on this, if a pool had caught fire, and one nearly did at Fukushima Daiichi, it was sheer luck that it didn't. Instead of 160,000 nuclear evacuees, there could have been as many as 50 million, and that according to the prime minister who was serving at the time. He said it would have been the end of the Japanese state. And the pool risks in the United States are greater than those in Japan because our pools are packed more densely. So other risks of pool storage are leakage into groundwater and uh, surface water, as has been going on at Indian Point, upstream on the Hudson from New York City for decades at this point. And also the risk of heavy load drops. Even the transfer out of the pools is high risk, has to be done very carefully. We've had near misses in Minnesota, We've had near misses in Michigan and in Vermont with uh, stuck cranes and slippage of cranes. So this gives you an idea of what dry cask storage looks like. Uh, vertically oriented dry casks, horizontally oriented dry casks. And there have been major issues around the country since dry cask storage began in 1986. Just a few examples. This is multiple cask designs and models. This is multiple sites. Uh, seal leakage at North Anna, I'm sorry, at Surrey, Virginia, where if you lose the inerting uh, heat transfer medium, the helium gas, you can overheat the nuclear fuel inside. Cracking of containers, as at Palisades in Michigan. Uh, hydrogen gas generation, explosions and fires, as at Point Beach in Wisconsin. The list goes on and on. Uh, Faulty shims, as at San Onofre, California, just recently revealed, we had that problem at Palisades in Michigan, where I'm from, as early as 1994. And so I mentioned hardened on-site storage. These are the gentlemen who uh, conceived of it and gave it its uh, phraseology. Dr. Arjun Makajani of Institute for Energy and Environmental Research coined the phrase hardened on-site storage. Dr. Gordon Thompson, commissioned by Citizen Awareness Network, of the Northeast wrote a report in January 2003 called Robust Storage. We have a statement of principles for safeguarding nuclear waste at reactors that should be in your packets. And by the way, I will post this at the Beyond Nuclear website, beyondnuclear.org, with detailed explanations of these and links to these documents. We have over 200 groups in all 50 states signed on to these principles. And uh, we've been calling for this since 2002, actually. Uh, it's been a long time we've been calling for this, and it's falling on deaf ears uh, in the U.S. federal government and the nuclear power industry. So significant upgrades to safety and security are required. And one point I'd like to mention at the end there is to prohibit reprocessing the extraction of plutonium from high-level radioactive waste, which Holtec in New Mexico plans to do if they can get away with it. So this is one state's example of the group signed on to these principles, and some of those groups helped organize today, so thank you very much for that. So on the left there, you see a graphic representation of hardened on-site storage by Dr. Thompson. As compared to the bowling pin, dense configuration, which is a, a high security risk if attackers were to show up with anti-tank weapons, for example. So fortifications are necessary. And I should add that some sites are not appropriate for on-site hardened storage. A place like Prairie Island, Minnesota, which is the home of the Prairie Island Indian community, a floodplain in the Mississippi River, it has to go to higher ground, it has to go further inland, but not 1,000 or 2,000 miles away to New Mexico, rather a few miles away for the interim. And this will be required no matter what, because if Yucca Mountain were to open today, which of course it won't, if CIS, Centralized Interim Storage, opened today, it would take 50 years to move the waste to these sites. That's 50 years of ongoing on-site risk that should be addressed. Holtec, the basis of the New Mexico Centralized Interim Storage, has a quality assurance epidemic going on dating back to the year 2000. We have whistleblower information from industry and from NRC that major quality assurance violations are associated with the Holtex. This has not been rectified by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in all these years and decades. 
So the whistleblowers um, pointed out that decisions like this in the space program led to space shuttles hitting the ground. And uh, Dr. Landsman will serve as an expert witness for the Environmental Coalition challenging the Holtec centralized interim storage. The structural integrity of these containers being questioned not at 60 miles per hour on the rails, but at zero miles per hour in on-site storage. The pools need to be emptied of their contents, but should be retained in case there's an emergency need to transfer from old degraded cask into new replacement cask. Now the risks of moving this material through 44 states, through 100 major urban centers in this country, through 330 of the 435 house districts. This gives you an idea of the, the layers of protection, but are they robust enough for severe accidents? And I should point out that centralized interim storage would make these much nearer term risks. So there has been talk, it's now delayed of 2021 for pilot interim storage, of 2024 for full scale. And why are these sites in the Texas-New Mexico borderlands being targeted? Because the attitude is this is a nuclear sacrifice zone. You have a national low-level radioactive waste dump in Texas at Waste Control Specialists. You have the WIP site, waste isolation, pilot, waste isolation Pilot Plant in New Mexico for plutonium from the military disposal. You see a uh, 2014 industrial fire at WIP, followed a few days later by a plutonium release to the environment that was supposed to be impossible. And this site in Texas is near or above the Oglala Aquifer. These are not appropriate sites. It's not a nuclear sacrifice zone. There are large Hispanic communities there. The two sites are within 40 miles of each other. And so um, the risks of centralized interim storage is that it becomes permanent, that then the Containers could degrade and release their contents at the surface of the planet. And even if the waste were to leave, this is multiplying transport risks unnecessarily. On the left, you see a congressional tour of Yucca Mountain, as just happened, led by John Shimkus. This is a waste of taxpayer money that has to stop. And uh, our joke about the Yucca Dump is it's a, a mutant zombie with six toes on either foot, and you see one of the toes twitching. A thousand environmental groups have opposed the Yucca Dump for a generation and will continue to do so. This gives you an idea of all the states impacted by road and rail shipments. This map shows you how intense those shipments are in a state like Illinois, where most of the shipments are actually from reactors in other states moving through. And then as you get further west, especially in Utah and Nevada, uh, the worst of the transport impacts. Uh, waste control specialists in Texas, all mainline rail could be used for these shipments. And here's Holtec's map. They only want to look at Maine Yankee and uh, San Onofre, California. What about the 120 other reactors in this country? What about those transport risks? And I would point out that um, a place like Fort Worth, Texas would get hit coming and going, first out to, out to New Mexico and then up to Yucca Mountain. So an example of how high risk the Department of Energy is willing to undertake, liquid high-level radioactive waste shipments for the first time in North American history began last year. There needs to be congressional oversight, and we thank uh, Senator Gillibrand and Representative Higgins for questioning this very high-risk behavior through their, their state. And so here's an example of very risky barge shipments of high-level waste bound for the West um, on the Hudson River past Manhattan. Are you kidding me? This is a Department of Energy proposal. Talk about the security risks. But it's many other waterways, the Great Lakes, rivers, sea coasts. Here are road and rail shipments through New York. Here's right here where we're standing, Capitol Hill. And um, I live in Mount Rainier, Maryland. There is a train line that would carry waste through where I live. I work in Tacoma Park, Maryland. If you stand on the metro platform in Tacoma Park, you could get a gamma and neutron dose as one of these things goes by. This is too close for comfort for the high risks of these shipments. State of Nevada deserves a shout out for their analysis of these risks. And again, these will be posted on the website. Study the details of places you care about. Because if we don't do something about it, it's going to start coming through and put them at risk. An alternative to barges would be these heavy haul trucks, which have their own risks. This is a reactor pressure vessel, not high-level waste, at Big Rock Point in northern Michigan. They had several incidents in 2003 during this uh, heavy haul truck shipment to get it to a, a railhead and put it on a train. This is uh, um, Interstate 40 in Oklahoma in the spring of 2002, just as the Yucca votes were happening in Congress <coughs> at the time. 
the underwater submersion design criteria for these containers is dangerously inadequate. And so too, the high temperature, long duration fire risk scenario. A July 2001 underground tunnel fire in downtown Baltimore. And uh, Dr. Marvin Reznikoff of Radioactive Waste Management Associates studied the details of this fire, asking the question, what if a Holtec container had been in that? And his conclusion was it would have failed. It would have released at least a fraction of its contents. And uh, large numbers of people would have been injured by that. It would have cost $14 billion to clean up the mess. Uh, the risk of attacks. Um, these containers are not designed to withstand anti-tank missiles. Uh, <coughs> Shimkus himself at a congressional hearing said it's hard to fire a tow anti-tank missile. It would be hard to hit one of these shipments with such a 40-year-old weapon system. Well, attackers would probably uh, be trained in their use, and they are designed to hit Soviet tanks that go 37 miles per hour. And so these shipments would slow down in a place like south side of Chicago. A very large fraction of shipments would go through there, and uh, they could be hit. And there have been upgrades to these um, anti-tank weapon systems over the decades. So these are where the radioactive poisons go. If, uh, if there is a breach of a shipping container to different organs and tissues in the human body, depending on the isotope, even if there's not an accident, uh, incident-free routine shipments still emanate gamma radiation and neutrons at a rate of 10 millirem per hour at a distance of six feet. That's why we call them mobile x-ray machines that can't be turned off, and they cause harm to people nearby. That's one to two chest x-rays per hour. If the shipment happens to be contaminated externally, France has had hundreds of these documented, sometimes 500 to 3,300 times permissible dose rates. The United States has 50 documented examples of this. It would cause more harm to people nearby. This is Fred Upton, who's long advocated for the yucca dump. Uh, Shimkus has now taken the lead. H.R. 3053 passed. The House on May 10th uh, is now over on the Senate side. Would increase the allowable amount to be buried at yucca would gut the licensing proceeding, uh, is non-consent based in violation of the Blue Ribbon Commission's final report, and is adamantly opposed by the environmental movement of the United States. It's ironic that Upton supports these ideas because barred shipments on Lake Michigan could put at risk the drinking water supply for 40 million people downstream in two countries and a large number of Native American First Nations if just one of them goes down and leaks. Again, the irony for uh, Congressman Shimkus is that thousands of shipments of high-level waste from other states would pass through Illinois, including on the south and west sides of Chicago, bound for the west. On the Senate side, you've got Senate Energy and Water Appropriations, uh, Alexander and Feinstein, that are more interested in centralized interim storage, it's fair to say. And the irony of that is what would that mean if San Onofre's waste were to be rushed into transport through the heart of Metro LA. We are not ready for this. Nobody even knows about this. Transport communities along the corridors involved do not consent to these risks. And uh, we're now closer to 80 years into this mess. We need to stop making it. We need to harden on-site storage. We need to stop pursuing these dead ends at Yucca Mountain and centralized interim storage and prevent these risky transports. Thank you. <laughs> Kevin Camps, thank you. Kevin is with Beyond Nuclear and will be available for interviews like all of our expert panelists. What we've been listening to and in these incredible problems associated with high-level radioactive waste impact communities. Part of the reason we are so deeply concerned is that uh, I'm going to turn to Mayor Al Hill who will explain uh, that in Zion, Illinois, there is a decommissioned nuclear power plant from 1998. Suffice to say, it affects the community. Air Hill, we're glad to have you with us. Thank you. I do have to get my glasses on. I'm getting older. Things change. Um, I am Al Hill, and I am the mayor of Zion, Illinois, a community with a population of 25,000, located approximately 45 miles north of Chicago, and situated directly on Lake Michigan. I am not an expert on nuclear power or fuel storage or transportation, but I would like to share with you our experience as a host to a nuclear power plant as well as a decommissioning and fuel storage process. The Zion Nuclear Power Plant 
was licensed by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in 1973 and operated from 74 to 98. Decommissioning is expected to complete it before the end of the year. We presently have 64 dry cast storage units on site in Zion. In 1968, the nuclear power was a new technology that was to provide low-cost electric power. This was good for Zion, good for Illinois, and good for our country. People under, in Zion understood that locating the power plant within the community and along the shores of Lake Michigan would entail some cost. There was an understanding that the community would give up 257 acres of lakefront property, uh, that there would be an eyesore on the community uh, that would be there a long, long time, that recreational access to the lake for visitors as well as local citizens would be severely limited, and an understanding that economic development opportunities associated with the lakefront would be severely inhibited. In exchange for the cost, there was an understanding that the Zion community would benefit from locating the power plant. Zion would benefit from the jobs created by the plant, that each taxing body would receive significant tax dollars from the increased equalized assessed valuation of the plant, and that when the operating license of the plant expired, there were 257 acres that would be returned to pristine condition and the property returned for development purposes. That was the deal. It was an unwritten deal, but that was the deal. There was never, ever an understanding that once the plant closed, the Zion community would play host to a radioactive dump that contains 2.2 million, and I'll say that again, 2.2 million pounds of nuclear spent fuel rods on our lakefront. That was not part of the deal. I speak for all the citizens of Zion when I say that we do not want to be a storage facili facility for radioactive waste. Our community is staggering. The closure and decommissioning of the plant has had a ne negative impact on local taxes, local empo employment, and our ability to maintain sustainable economic development. We were crushed by the loss of nearly half of our property tax base in 1998. When operating, the Zion Nuclear Station contributed over $19 million a year to the cost of local services. Today, they contribute slightly more than $1 million. Closure of the plant also saw the loss of 800 full-time, well-paying jobs. Estimates are that $42 million per year was lost from payroll to Zion and the surrounding communities. Without considering the safety of nuclear waste, when businesses are considering locating in Zion or making real estate investments, the nuclear waste presents a negative perception of our community. Plans call for development of the lakefront, and we are unable to attract uh, investments to that, uh, to what should be the most va valuable waterfront land uh, along Lake Michigan. The City of Zion Comprehensive Plan calls for the development concepts that are intended to preserve and enhance the natural areas and to create economic opportunities through new housing, educational, and tourism uses. The lost opportunity for economic development on the lakefront property is one of the most difficult realities for our community. With the 2010 scuttling of the Yucca Mountain program, we are not naive enough to believe that the rods will be removed anytime soon. We therefore believe that our community should be compensated. We also believe that the federal government should do the compensating. In 1982, the United States Congress enacted the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, which was intended to begin the process of disposing of nuclear waste. The act contains a section entitled Interim Storage Fund. This section references impact assistance, which says that, and I paraphrase, <laughs> the secretary shall make annual payments to a state or appropriate unit of local government or both in order to mitigate the social or economic impact occasioned by the establishment of subsequent operation of an interim storage capacity within the jurisdictional boundaries of such government. Impact assistance could be as high as $15 <coughs> per kilogram of spent fuel. Payments made shall be allocated in a fair and equitable manner with a priority to those states or units of local government suffering the most severe impacts. I can't imagine any government anywhere that will suffer more severely than the Zion area communities. We're talking about Lake Michigan, lakefront property, 
that is valued at a fraction of its fair market value because of one million kilograms of radioactive waste stored on the shoreline. Zion has never been asked about and never contemplated or consented to converting the decommissioned site to an indefinite and long-term nuclear storage facility. The intent of the 1982 federal regulation is clear that communities will suffer social and economic impacts if they are designated as interim storage facilities and that they should be compensated. Senator Tammy Duckworth and Congressman Brad Schneider have introduced legislation in the 115th Congress that would go a long way to make affected communities whole. The legislation will not only apply to Zion, but other communities throughout the United States that are experiencing the decommissioning process. The act is called, and you've got to bear with this one, Sensible Timely Relief for Americans <laughs> Nuclear District Economic Development Act of 2017. And that, that all goes out to stranded, and it talks about <laughs> stranded <laughs> nuclear waste. Uh, these are um, H.R. 3970 and S. 1903. I am hopeful that this legislation will successfully pass both houses of Congress. This is an issue that su should receive bipartisan support. Nuclear power plants are located in both Republican and Democratic districts. I am hopeful for what this legislation will do for Zion, for the Zion community. I am particularly hopeful of what it will do for all communities across the United States that are presently hosting nuclear power plants. Every one of those plants are facing decommissioning and the spent fuel storage issue. I hope that the legislation will help those communities avoid the pitfalls that Zion has had to deal with and is still dealing with 20 years after closing. I want to thank you for your time and your attention and I also want to thank you for the opportunity to share our experience with you. I do want to say that I have, uh, because of time factors, I've kind of glossed over the details of what's happened in our community. But if any of you have any questions afterwards, I will be happy to go in, into details on housing values and, uh, and the like, things like that, since, since this has happened. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor Hill. Um, our next speaker uh, has an extremely long, I don't want to say exposure, to <laughs> nuclear issues. Many of us are not familiar with the health effects and what these things can do to individuals. Um, but our next speaker, Ian Zabarti, is the principal man of the Western Bands of the Shoshone Nation of Indians. He's secretary of the Native Community Action Council. That's a party withstanding in NRC docket number 63001 of Yucca Mountain. And he has extensively studied the health effects and is deeply concerned based on the science that Native American populations are not protected by any of the plans around Yucca Mountain and elsewhere. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ian Zabarti. I'm the principal man of the Western Bands, the Shoshone Nation of Indians. I'm also the secretary for the Native Community Action Council. Um, we are a party withstanding in the Atomic Safety Licensing Board proceedings on Yucca Mountain. Uh, we have three primary contentions. First, ownership. Treaty of Ruby Valley of 1863 is in full force and effect, uh, and Western Shoshone title remains unextinguished. That is our primary contention in the Atomic Safety Licensing Board. And even with the Department of Energy using the Bureau of Land Management's master title plats, which are the land status record of the United States government, the Department of Energy cannot prove ownership, and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission does not adjudicate title. Our other contentions are, based on our past exposure from fallout in weapons testing, uh, we cannot endure any increased burden of risk from any source. That includes fracking radiation, that includes coal ash radiation, or any high-level nuclear waste that would be transported or uh, stored in our country. Our final contention is uh, water right, which is water, uh, water which is necessary. Uh, we view it both spiritually and as a property right. And those are our three primary contentions. If you want to ask me more about it, you can go to our website, which is nativecommunityactioncouncil.org, and uh, all of the information is there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian, for that. Um, all of these issues, I, I think Bob Alvarez started with talking about half-lives that go up into the millions of years. I'm not sure our next speaker will be here, but he will be here 
after many of us. And so we have a youth representative. Uh, I want to uh, introduce, uh, there he is, Jackson Hinkle. He's a graduate of San Clemente High School, member of San Clemente Green, a reg regional youth director of Earth Guardians, organized a youth-led campaign that led to the re uh, removal of plastic water bottles from over 60 campuses. Uh, and he's also, interestingly, since we're here to talk about policy, politics, and how to solve these issues, he's the founder of the Orange County Students for City Council, a coalition that is currently recruiting, mobilizing, and supporting progressive students to run for city council uh, positions. So uh, we're glad to have you here and representing. Thank you all for having me. And uh, before I begin, I just wanted to say how great it is to see so many young faces in this crowd. Um, in this movement, you don't see a lot of young faces, but just know this is your future. This is your children's future, their children's future, and so on. So if you don't remember anything else today, take that with you. Um, so my name is Jackson Hinkle. I'm 18 years old. I am representing San Clemente Green here today, and I'm also representing the voices of future generations. My, in my home of San Clemente, California, many of the speakers have already touched on the San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station, um, is a current home to nuclear waste, um, and the waste is being stored in what is known as thin-walled canisters. Thin-walled canisters are widely used across the United States, um, but not so much in other countries. They're 5 eighths of an inch thick. They can't be monitored for cracks, repaired if there was something to go wrong with the canister, and they can't be transported. Um, there's many problems with, with that when you're dealing with nuclear waste, if, if you just kind of gloss over what I just said. Um, in addition to all those things, moist marine salts and potassium chloride that's found in New Mexico can cause corrosion and cracks in these canisters. Once a crack starts, it only takes 16 years to grow completely through the wall, according to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. The president of Holtec, the manufacturer of the, of the canisters used near my home of San Clemente, California, has even admitted that it is not feasible to repair canisters, even if you could find cracks. He stated that as much as a microscopic through-wall crack in a canister will release millions of curies of radionuclides into the atmosphere. We can no longer treat this catastrophic issue as a minor inconvenience, and we can no longer kick this radioactive can down the road. Moving forward, what we need to do is oppose consolidated interim storage bills, such as H.R. 3053. We must require a high-priority project to, to move existing nuclear fuel from thin-walled canisters to thick-walled casks. And lastly, we need to find the safest location to store thick-walled casks and reinforce buildings for additional environmental and security protection. What many people fail to see or seem to ignore is the fact that the mismanagement of nuclear waste doesn't only pose issues for future generations and far down the road. It's going to affect us right now, and it already is affecting us right now. Um, and it's going to continue to affect us if we don't deal with it properly. So thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Jackson. I, I'm only a couple of years older, so <clears throat> I want to join your group, San Clemente <laughs> Green. Just hit me up. <laughs> All right. yeah. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> last not, but not least, our, our final speaker uh, is Jeffrey Fettis. He's a senior attorney with the Natural Resources Defense Council, NRDC, uh, with their Energy and Transportation Program. He's won uh, cases uh, before the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, a successful challenge to the wonderful EPA radiation protection standards for the proposed Yucca Mountain Nuclear Waste Repository. I remember testifying on those as a somewhat absurd exercise. But thank you for all that. And uh, why don't you bring us on home and Jeff Fettis. Get to the right slide. Here we go. How's the sound? Good? Uh, my name is Jeff Fettis. Uh, thanks, Bob. Um, I'm a senior attorney at NRDC, and I'm going to turn to uh, um, 
unlike my colleagues here, I'm going to turn to a slightly more practical um, set of discussions, and they've done a good job of setting up a lot of the risks and the realities of what we face. But I want to turn to a few things that are going on right now and why I think this briefing is so well timed for Congress um, to start considering. First, uh, again, this is all on the um, EESI website. Um, this is coming. This is the trajectory uh, slide that we have. In the last several years, six reactors at five plants have closed, either for economic or safety-related reasons. Two close uh, in the next several years are at least seven reactors at five plants. And there are only two under construction right now, and the trajectory of those are at best uncertain. Uh, two got canceled this past year in South Carolina, new build AP1000 reactors. So whatever one's position is on issues related to nuclear power uh, and whether or not one submits to the idea that 80-year licensing is a reality, there is a downward trajectory and decommissioning is coming. And I want to also just caution you right at the outset that decommissioning really isn't just about the nuclear waste issues, although NRDC and myself in particular have a long and public history of testifying on the matters, litigating on the matters, and I'm happy to talk with any of you at enormous length about all of these things. Um, but let's put that to the side and talk about what decommissioning is as well besides the nuclear waste. Uh, and Mayor Hill really touched on that. It is a gigantic industrial cleanup of huge industrial facilities that have a singular item, nuclear waste, that makes it more complicated and more challenging than almost any other industrial cleanup. But please make no mistake, you have profound amounts of piping, concrete, cleanup, uh, extraordinary efforts that have to get done at these facilities that have been radioactive and used as industrial with industrial chemicals as well for decades upon decades. And let's turn to what that really means, and I'll update you on some reality. So a few years ago, the NRC, to its credit, um, and again, hell just froze over because NRDC just said that, but NRDC, to its credit, got started on working on a rulemaking to finally address many of the issues with decommissioning. They, they saw the wave coming because it was really apparent by 2015 that you couldn't miss it. Um, the advance notice came out in November, the final basis. The, the basis, and that's NRDC code speak, and if they're NRDC folks here in the room, they can explain it even better than I can. But that's basically what they're going to put in the rule and what they're not going to put in the rule, meaning what they're going to treat as guidance and not actually have as a legal requirement. And they do that before they even have a draft rule. So they have a final basis that came out in November of last year. And now there is the NRC staff has submitted a draft rule to the commission for its consideration. I cannot tell you when the draft rule will come out for public comment because that's up to the commission and the commissioners, the five NRC commissioners, and when they vote on it, send it forward or send it back to staff and if they even make any changes. Again, that's up to the commission. It is our best guess that that rule will come out later this year, early next year. That is our best guess, but again, you're better served asking the NRC at that moment. Um, the final rule will come out in either 2019 or 2020, presuming they fit that time frame. Now you're thinking, well, we have all these decommissioning issues. Well, the NRC is doing a rulemaking to address all these issues. That's true, they are, and they're to be commended for starting a rulemaking on decommissioning. Unfortunately, as of right now, and then again, this could change because the NRC commissioners could send it back. We don't expect that. But as of right now, there are some significant issues of dispute and contentiousness that the rule is not addressing that they're not going to solve many of the problems, especially those cited by Mayor Hill which I've heard him do at longer proceedings, which he can do in great detail. Um, but the, let me briefly walk you through what some of these 
moments of contentiousness, issues of contentiousness are likely to be, and the fact that the NRC's decommissioning rule is not only unlikely to solve many of the decommissioning problems, this tsunami that is coming of massive industrial cleanup, but I think they're going to make it worse, and I think Congress is going to be called on, either through its legislative or through its appropriations powers, to start to solve some of these problems. So this is, I think, the start of this. So the first issue is the biggest one. Right now, when Zion or any other nuclear uh, operator decides to end its licensed operations and move into decommissioning, it doesn't actually need to file a plan that the NRC approves. The, they basically just send the NRC a letter. And the NRC has no, has es essentially currently cedes its regulatory authority. And I think that will continue to be the case based on the draft rule that we've seen thus far. And there, that also comes along with a whole host of issues. When the NRC cedes that regulatory authority and doesn't keep regulatory requirement on you have to meet X environmental standards or Y cleanup standards, there's no opportunity for the state, for the local community, for any NGOs, for any tribes to intervene and say that's not good enough or we think the cleanup should be better, or, for example, we think the cleanup should go faster or slower, or we'd like our already trained workforce to be a part of that cleanup. And right now, that segues into the state and local government role. When the decommissioning plan is not a requirement, and there's also no National Environmental Policy Act coverage of it, which means this is certainly a major federal action that affects the environment, how that cleanup will go. That's essentially put to the side by the current lack of rules and even by the proposed rule that we're likely to see this next year. The, that, that extraordinarily limits any state and local government role. So not only did Mayor Hill's uh, folks in Zion not have a voice, future communities uh, all around the country will not have a voice. And then again, this is, a, this is truly a bipartisan issue. This is about those local and state voices. The community transition and workforce needs are also right now, because of the lack of any regulatory authority and the likelihood to, of the NRC to continue ceding that authority, um, Right now, one of the things that can happen is there are three ways, basically, that decommissioning can take place. And I'll go nerdy for a second, but I'll take you with me. Way one is called decon, and that's what it just sounds what it sounds like. It's, de it's decommissioning, where within the first several years, the actual cleanup really starts going. And that's what happened with Zion, actually. They did get going and start on the cleanup and do the work and remove the concrete, break down the piping, dispose of things to license radioactive waste or other disposal sites, and actually do the cleanup. There is a lot of wisdom in doing that because you actually have already, that provides a, a transition for workforces that are inevitably going to go down as reactors do close. Um, it also, you have trained radiation health safety staff that's there. There's another way to do decommissioning that's also allowed under the rules, and more and more reactor operators are availing themselves of this, and it's called safe store. And safe store means under the rules right now and under the proposed, likely proposed rules, uh, reactor operators can sit on those sites for years upon years, decades upon decades, up to 60 years which takes that extraordinary amount of viable commercial land out of the communities for those times. Um, needless to say, a lot of communities are very s upset about this concept, as are a lot of states. Uh, the NRC has heard about that in great detail in the comments thus far, not just from NRDC, but several states. Um, that goes to why are some of those reactor operators doing that? Well. Sometimes they haven't saved enough for decommissioning, and that's another issue. The GAO has done several excellent reports that we cite, and by the way, if anybody wants uh, NRC's comments 
on the process thus far, as well as citations to the GAO reports on the adequacy of the um, surety amounts that have been put aside for decommissioning or sort of the lack thereof. That's going to be a significant issue with this rule. Will the NRC require enough to make sure there will be enough to pay on the back end for this extraordinary cleanup? Um, and then, of course, there are emergency preparedness issues. You heard a whole host of reasons today why those are necessary going forward, especially while we have fuel sitting in um, spent fuel pools. Um, and also, of course, the radiological issues. All of these issues will be significantly – we don't know what's going to happen, but the draft rule, as we've seen it thus far, does not look likely to solve any of these issues, and we think that means when the agency hasn't done it, it's likely to come back to Congress. And um, the Duckworth bill, uh, the Duckworth and Schneider, I should – House and Senate, the Duckworth and Schneider bill – about that compensation actually is one of those, we think, few constructive efforts that really gets at compensating the communities that by any measure are going to have spent fuel in their communities for decades to come, as well as under a safe store and the likelihood of a lot of uh, reactor operators just sitting on the sites for decades at a time rather than immediately moving to cleanup. And one last uh, thing, when you, even when you do decon, just to not make sure I have any illusions here for those of you who are not familiar with the nuclear cleanup world, when, even when you do decon, uh, the faster version, you're still not going in to be breaking apart reactor vessels for at least a decade or many, many years. So by any measure, these are going to be large, long cleanup processes. Um, that was basically it, except to say, as a last note, the nuclear waste issues that NRDC has worked on and that you heard so much about today really should be seen as a separate issue where there's a national debate about how to solve these issues. And I'm happy to talk at length about that. What I'm very interested in Congress doing in the next few years on the decommissioning side of thing, things is one, making sure the communities that have these enormous burdens that by any measure they're going to have while these giant industrial cleanups start to move forward in place after place is that those communities are well served by federal law, which means not just compensation, but also significant oversight on making sure the decommissioning process solves most of the issues, if not all of it. And right now it's not going to. So thank you. I want to thank all our speakers for an amazing job of bringing these incredibly technical and challenging subjects to light in an interesting and informative way. And now you have a chance. Uh, we have about a half hour. And I'd like to call on people, if you would uh, identify who you are, where you're from, and then pose your question. The floor is now open to all of you. Yes, ma'am. My name's Ashley. I'm from um, Senator Debbie Stabenow's office from Michigan. Uh, my question is, the west side of our state is preparing for the closure of Palisades um, in 2022. Um, and I'm just wondering, what can governments at any level do to prevent the out-migration um, of nuclear employees and to encourage economic development in post-nuclear communities? Thank you. Kevin, are you well, just uh, full disclosure, I'm from Kalamazoo, Michigan, and uh, I've lived here for 20 years, but Kalamazoo is still home. We have said till we were blue in the face that, I'm sorry, um, we have said until we were blue in the face that the workforce at Palisades, as Jeff just said, should be retained. They have the institutional knowledge of that badly contaminated site. They've had tritium leaks into soil and groundwater at that site going back at least a decade. There's drinking water for the adjacent Palisades Park community that is implicated by those leaks into groundwater. And the leaks that go into the lake are then um, a hazard for the drinking water in South Haven. So with the institutional knowledge of those workers, they should be the ones in charge of the cleanup for years or even decades to come. And there is a lot to clean up at that site. 
And the other major issue at that site is safeguarding and securing the high-level radioactive waste, many hundreds of tons, that is currently right on the lakeshore, 150 yards from the water, in violation of NRC earthquake safety regulations. That waste needs to be moved further inland to higher ground, out of any earthquake danger, out of any tsunami danger on the Great Lakes. And the workforce that's there now could, could be in charge of that. And in addition, uh, we need to transition to nuclear-free, carbon-free electricity sources. And so workers could be younger workers, perhaps, uh, once decommissioning is done, uh, could be retrained to work in the solar industry, the wind industry, both of which have incredible potential in southwest Michigan. Just look in South Haven. There's a major solar array over by Lake Michigan College. And then the lakeshore wind power potential is just uh, tremendous. And so that's what we would say about that. I can also address that by uh, you wanted to know what could be done. And uh, through our experience, we had no idea what could be done. Uh, Exelon kept approximately 150 workers uh, on staff uh, for probably 10, 10 to 15 years. Um, many of the other uh, highly trained, um, highly paid employees went to other nuclear power plants throughout the state of Illinois, and that's part of what affected our community. When people moved, the housing values in our community dropped tremendously. Not only did we lose the uh, value of the plant, but we lost the housing values when people moved out. Many of them became abandoned, um, and we uh, went from a community that had about 30% uh, of our living units were rental units right now. And now th this is with the housing crisis of uh, 2008 after that hit also. We have 66% of our living units in town are rental units. And uh, we have 3.8% of the population of Lake County, which is approximately 800,000 people. And uh, we have 35% of the low-income low housing vouchers in our community. And it has just put a stress on our schools. It's put a, a stress on our police and fire. Um, it, it has just... Uh, put a stress on uh, a lot of the services that we provide. I'd like to add one quick thing to, to be very explicit. <clears throat> when you look at, and the unions have put this out in relation to the um, decommissioning rulemaking thus far, um, it's probably on the NRC website, or if not, I'll find it for you. But if you look at the likely drop off of employment in allowing for the decon process, you have at least you have a slow glide path down. And there can be arguments as to where that glide path should be and what over time. But if you look at the likelihood of employment and what could happen to a community under aggressive use of the safe store option, where the essentially the, reoperator, the reactor operator simply mothballs things, it just drops like a stone. And that could be absolutely savage to a, to a region that we think the rules need to be thoughtfully structured to not allow that to happen. And that's not the way we're going right now. Thank you. In the back, but before we do that, I just want to ask our speakers. We have two options. We're doing multimedia and different microphones. If you stay at the panel, if you would just project out to the back. Or if you're close enough to get to the podium, you could use this. Okay. It'll capture, uh, it may be hard on that end, but thank you very much. Uh, back there. Hi, I'll stand. Uh, my name is Hannah Vogel. I'm the senator at Murphy's office. Um, we are. We saw in the proposed rule that was sent to the commission that they uh, assumed uh, that the on-site on -site storage would remain there for 16 years. Um, while we'd love to have a permanent solution in 16 years, we're a little worried that that's over-optimistic. Um, and we're additionally concerned with the effects that climate change will have on some of the coastal storage. So um, we're having the Pilgrim nuclear site, they're having uh, very, uh, they're putting on site storage very close to the, the, the sea level. Um, and so I'm interested in kind of your take on the NRC storage uh, proposal and the decommissioning rule. Uh, and whether you think they're appropriately accounting for having tax when they're doing these sort of forecasts? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, specifically, uh, there are 
two frustrating things, and I'm actually the guy that litigated it, so sorry. Um, the, the NRC doesn't have to do a deep analysis of its long-term storage in the context of the decommissioning rule. It does so via its continued storage rule, which was unfortunately um, given validation by the D.C. Circuit in 2016. Um, that said, they're going to have to continue to do NEPA analysis over the next several years on that continued storage rule, and that will be the vehicle to look at the issue of the viability of continued storage. And so I'm happy to talk with you about that later. They kind of separate out the issues that they have to address via generic rulemakings or generic analysis. Um, and you would think that the decommissioning rule would address nuclear waste, but it really puts it to the side. And, and also the sea level rise issue will come up in a host of um, uh, context, not least of which in the 80 year relicensing as well, as well as long term storage um, in air, coastal areas um, especially. So. Sorry, my quick follow up to that as well is um, you mentioned that the dry cask storage is only um, meant for short term. How short term are the casks meant to be used? I think Mr. Alvarez um, they're licensed for 40-year periods, so that's and they can be relicensed if they hold up. Uh, I think my general observation is that we uh, are letting the the symbolic quest for a disposal solution cart to basically put it in front of the safe storage horse. We lack a national storage policy. It's one of default. That's why we have pools jam-packed uh, and, uh, and, and, and sort of D NRC acting in a very reactive way to things happening. We don't have any rational program. And to, quite frankly, the Department of Energy ha should have a, a role in this besides trying to restart Yucca Mountain. Uh, but they're not. And so uh, uh, there needs to be some sort of uh, way to take a look at storage as a priority before we start to think we can, we can actually find a disposal site. Because I find that what's happening here is largely uh, an effort to seek a symbolic victory. Regarding your question about the canisters and how long uh, we really have with all of them, just north of where I live, um, there's Diablo Canyon, and there was a canister at Diablo Canyon that was only two years old that showed all the signs of uh, cracking, um, but there's no way of actually checking to see if there is cracking, so that, that's a problem that the NRC has not dealt with in a good way. If I may add. The model we should be emulating is probably that which is developed by Germany and Switzerland. Uh, they became very serious about things like airplane crashes, tow missile attacks, and things like that in the 1980s. And they heavied up their switch yards, their containment domes, and have thick walled dry canisters that are in, in buildings capable of withstanding large aerial impacts. Uh, we don't have that, and uh, we need to start to think about how do we deal with the long term challenge posed by indefinite storage of this material on the surface. Let's see up here. Yeah, uh, my name is Jeff Johnson. I'm a reporter with Cable Global Engineering News. On that same subject, I've been listening to this. I've been trying to figure out what's the solution. In the, in the short term, the long term, it seems like if transportation is a problem, if on-site storage is a problem, if in-pool storage is a problem, if dry cast storage is a problem, is there any solution? Is, is the one that you're talking about, Bob, is that what we should be actually doing? Or did I miss it? Or maybe I missed something. Maybe there was something that came by. I, I'm happy to talk to NRDC's perspective. So it's just we're not a monolithic group. Right, no. Um, in, in RDC's perspective is there is a solution and there has been a solution and we agree with the long-term solution of geologic repositories as the ultimate. I think Bob is abs absolutely right that we need to be girding for the long-term in terms of interim storage and the idea of Haas 
and much, much more robust interim storage during the long pendency of time that we're going to need to get to repositories. It, it, we have, it, as just NRDC, aggressively pushed over the last decade an idea that we think can solve the institutional and technical challenges related to getting to a geologic repository, and that is, very simply, doing away with the environmental exemptions in the Atomic Energy Act, which is essentially allowing EPA and the states regulatory authority over nuclear waste. There would be one whale of a regulatory process once that happens, but once it's done, there could actually be a process where you could get to technically defensible and science and publicly accepted repositories, unlike the issue now where you're essentially telling the state of Nevada, you have no choice, you're just going to take it. And we have 50 years of evidence that that has not worked. And we know that the only safe place for this material, and it's not even that safe, we don't know it yet, but the only viable option is NRDC, and we're sort of in the grand consensus with most of our colleagues, is geologic repositories. We have to figure out about how to get there. It's not just finding a place, it's finding how to get there in a publicly accepted way. We think there's a serious way to do it, and I'd be thrilled to talk to all of you, but again, that's nuclear waste. The decommissioning issue, which I want to keep your eye on the ball here, is this gigantic cleanup that has a profound effect on community after community, congressional district after congressional district, Senate state concern, Senate state concern. So hold the two issues in parallel, but that's the... Okay. Kevin, did you want to add something? Just real briefly, I'll project better. Um, you know, it's good news that um, Oyster Creek, New Jersey, the oldest operating reactor in this country, pushing 50 years old, a Fukushima Daiichi twin design, is about to shut down. And the good news includes the fact that as soon as the nuclear fuel leaves the core, you cannot have a reactor core meltdown, by definition. But the risk moves to the pool and moves to the dry casks. And that's why we've emphasized hardened on-site storage as close to the point of origin as possible, but with rising sea levels, that may have to go inland and to higher ground. Not a thousand or two thousand miles out west to New Mexico for temporary storage, so called, but a few miles inland. And so I would emphasize the good news of reactor shutdowns, and now the focus has to turn to, as Bob just said, securing and safeguarding these forever deadly, he mentioned a million year half life another victory that Jeff won back in 2008 when EPA finally finished their court mandated rewrite of the Yucca regulations was an acknowledgement that Yucca would remain hazardous for a million years into the future. That's lowball. And in terms of deep geologic disposal, which is the end goal, there are some criteria that have to be met. Uh, scientific suitability, environmental justice, legality, uh, honoring treaty rights, uh, consent-based siting, uh, regional equity, transportation risk minimization. So we have a lot of work to do in this country, but I want to emphasize the good news of reactor shutdowns. Stop making the waste. Put a cap on this problem that grows by 2,000 metric tons per year. Okay. We had a hand back there, and then we'll come up front. Uh, sir. Yeah, this is Mark Richter, Nuclear Energy Institute. Uh, I do have one question related uh, to decommissioning and the process. Uh, and first of all, thank you to the panel for being here today. You've really presented, I think, a pretty broad spectrum of, of issues that kind of highlight a lot of the community concerns and regulatory concerns and, and those in the industry that are kind of deep. Uh, and you point to the tremendous cleanup and waste management problem that's represented by decommissioning and some of the, the pitfalls and the, and the challenges that are in front of us to do that, but in my mind I'm trying to reconcile that forward-looking challenge with past history over decades where more than a dozen plants have decommissioned, and I would argue safely, without any headline-grabbing serious issues either from an industrial safety or a nuclear safety standpoint. So I'm trying to reconcile, in my own mind at least, and maybe for those in the room, what, what has changed with time that Brings us to this point today. Mark, nice to see you. The um, two things I think 
that are really apparent right now that I think are the significant challenges facing the industry that we all share is making sure there's the adequate amount of money for it. Because in most of those, and you would certainly, I'm sure, acknowledge this, most of those cleanups have been substantially more expensive than they were first targeted. Uh, uh, the Humboldt Bay, which had a small test reactor, is now in the billions of dollars of cleanup. And I think its original target was $400 million or something like that. And that has happened at site after site. So the, so the adequacy of cleanup funding is, is a significant concern because it's turned out to be a much more expensive and complicated proposition than people originally thought. And I think the, uh, the emergence of SafeStore as a likely option of which your clients will avail themselves poses significant challenges for a whole host of communities in a way that the ones that have been decommissioned, honestly, haven't even suffered as much. I mean, as much as Mayor Hill talks about what Zion has suffered, I think um, reactor operators that go right into Safe Store and you see the actual cliff of, of employment, that will have profound effects on a, on a community. And that hasn't happened in the 12 or so that have been done thus far. So that's the first thing. Up front here. And I'm going to just repeat the questions, not because you're not clear, but so we can get our miking issues under control. Yeah, Stephanie Cook with Nuclear Intelligence Weekly. Um, it strikes me from what Kevin was saying and what Jackson was saying and Mayor Hill and the um, other speakers that um, there may be a conflict between the different communities facing nuclear plant closures and that some want to see interim storage and get, you know, just get it out as fast as possible and others are more reconciled to the fact it's just not going to happen that easily. Um, one question I have is to Mayor Hill is, do you talk to the other mayors about this? And are you going to try to come up with a unified position? And, and secondly, how long would it be before any of you think that if this interim storage ever worked out, an interim storage facility, I think a date was mentioned, but how realistically you know, soon they talk about if the NRC licenses if they could have it operating next to, you know, in the early 2020s. But what's the realistic date for interim storage if it ever happens? And what's the realistic date? We know 2048 isn't for permanent repository, but what is a realistic date? Okay. Let me just try for our, um, which basically this may expose differences between communities, some of whom want to deal with this on uh, nearby, some want to ship it out, there may be differences on that. Do the mayors, Mayor Hill and others, talk about developing a comprehensive strategy or how to agree on this? And then essentially what is a realistic timeline? Uh, for, for the interim and for... For, for, for interim and permanent storage. I can just address the, uh, the question of whether we talk to other mayors. And, uh, and there is a difference, I think, on, on what people would like to do. In our community, we would, like, we would like it to be gone. We would like them to start taking it tomorrow. Um, as I said uh, when I was speaking, we're not naive enough to think that that's going to happen. So we're asking for compensation. And uh, we have had um, uh, phone calls, and uh, we met in New York with uh, some, a lot of people on the eastern seaboard. Uh, about this uh, uh, problem, and I've called every mayor in the communities that are in de uh, that are in decommissioning or have been decommissioned. We have our school superintendents call calling every one of those school superintendents. We have our park and recreation people calling every park and recreation person. We go down; our librarians are calling their librarians, and we're asking that they contact their um, senators and their congressmen and make them aware of the issue, and that there is. A bill out there and uh, right now um, I guess I'll be completely honest nobody no one uh, expects anything to happen before the November election so we are waiting uh, word from uh, our senator and our congressman that we will uh, um, revisit that and we will try and get more information out to 
the federally elected officials that can, that have something to do with it. But we are organized. It's our city that's taken on that responsibility, and we're communicating with people. And um, that's where we are. As far as when it will happen, I, I have, I, I am expecting that it'll be 40 years from now is when they'll move it off of our facility, uh, out of our city. But um, I, our site is not hardened. These casts are sitting out there. They're about 200 yards from Lake Michigan. And you'd like to see them hardened? Oh, yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, I would like to see them hardened. And I said I, I have been assured time and time again that nothing can happen. These things are safe. They're absolutely safe. Nothing can happen to them. My question is, then why are there armed guards 24 hours a day, seven days a week, guarding them if nothing can happen? And nobody answers that question. They all kind of shrug and... and, and Kevin, I think well, you were. Oh, we'll just, um, I wanted to tell a story from a half life ago. Uh, 1997, I invited Ian Zabardi to a Don't Waste Michigan meeting. I still serve on the board of directors and introduced him to Dr. Mary Sinclair, the founder of Don't Waste Michigan, who is in the Women's History Hall of Fame in Michigan for her Great Lakes protection against reactor risks and radioactive waste risks. And at the time, as again now, Yucca Mountain was the talk of the town. Let's just dump it out there. Nobody lives out there. Who cares? It's a wasteland. It's not a wasteland. And Ian was able to explain to Dr. Sinclair not only about the Treaty of Ruby Valley, the environmental injustice of another blow to the Western Shoshone, the people of Nevada, after weapons testing and waste dumping. And she realized, despite her passion, and knowledge about protecting the Great Lakes from these risks, that Yucca Mountain was not a solution. And she contacted Senator Stabenow about this in the critical year of 2002. And thanks to Senator Stabenow for raising on the <coughs> Senate floor the risks of barge shipments. Not only is Yucca Mountain not a solution, these proposals would put the Great Lakes at even greater risk than before. So um, that's that issue of communities against each other. Uh, get it out of here. We don't care how it leaves or where it goes. That is not just. We are one nation under God, indivisible, and there is no exception for radioactive waste. So screw Nevada is not an option. Screw New Mexico is not an option. Screw Texas is not an option. And uh, for communities like San Onofre that are very much in harm's way, what about Camp Pendleton? How about a five mile move of the waste to a place where thousands of U.S. Marines can help guard it out of the tsunami zone, out of the earthquake zone. There's something else at work here. And what it is, and it's in H.R. 3053, is transfer of title for this forever deadly waste that this industry has prof profited mightily from generating onto American taxpayers. That is not a good reason for these very dangerously bad decisions. Um, one thing you mentioned, uh, which was the 2048, for those of you, again, who are not familiar with the nuclear cleanup world, the 2048 number comes from the previous administration's uh, likely calculation of arriving. They did a blue ribbon commission because when in Washington, D.C., one does blue ribbon commissions when one is not sure what to do. Um, and the blue ribbon commission that was finalized in 2012 uh, came out with a set of findings, the uh, key of which was we need to find and avoid what happened with Yucca Mountain and find a consent-based process. And it was their estimation and the administration then that 2048 would be a reasonable time. So that's why you sometimes hear the 2040s. People want time frames. No one has a crystal ball and can give you the precise time frame. It is NRDC's perspective and NRDC's alone that if Congress were to take up our idea of doing away with the environmental exemptions and actually changing the regulations to, to set the strong protective health criteria that we think are necessary and with EPA and state authority over that waste, that we could truncate some of that time. And I don't think it will happen in the next 10 years, but do I think it could happen within 20 or 25 if Congress gets off the dime and actually uh, solve, solve some of the original problems with the Nuclear Waste Policy Act that forgot about states and just, you know, right now we're sort of telling one state, you're going to get it, and they're saying, no, we're not. We're going to be stuck in this impasse for another 50 years. So hopefully we will not. Ian. Uh, I just want to emphasize that uh, Yucca Mountain is uh, Shoshone property, uh, 
recognized under the 1863 Treaty of Ruby Valley, and it's not going to happen. It's not workable. It's not doable because of that, and that is uh, the likely reason why it was with the application was withdrawn in the first place, but that wasn't argued in the case that came up. Um, Yucca Mountain would be a ongoing research and development project. It, it's not a solution. It's in the biosphere. It's above the water table, and the original intent of deep geologic disposal was subseabed below the water table. And what we're looking at at, at Yucca Mountain is just a matter of time before that radiation comes out. And my people expect to be around in another 10,000 years with your help. So uh, we see our food there, we see our resources there, and we need the pure water, pristine water, something that is very rare now on this planet. Pristine water is what we need for our survival. It's our religion. Uh, you know, we practice these living life ways in relation to the land. It's our identity, and we expect to be there. So Yucca Mountain is not going to be a solution, period. Ian, thanks. And That's about all the time we have. On a lighter note, I just want to be sure everybody understands that I don't want to screw Texas or New Mexico or Nevada. <laughs> <laughs> we understand. We would like to be compensated. So. That's great. Uh, I want to thank all of our speakers. I, uh, to try to summarize, it would be impossible, but I think one of the things that we have focused on is that decommissioning has been happening, is happening, will be increasingly happening, has immediate impacts that need to be dealt with now. There are long-range problems, long-range stories, repositories, and the like, but we have heard from communities, from young people, from the Native American tribes, and from experts that this material is dangerous, it is there, there will be more, and we need to do something about it. So I want to thank them for pointing that out in a very effective way. Thank you for your questions. Go back to your uh, to the Hill and try to create some action. I want to thank EESI for sponsoring this briefing. And there are many, many groups who have participated. There's actually a Citizens Lobby Day going on on these issues. And some members of those organizations who've been involved are here. So our experts uh, up front and s perhaps some people from participating organizations are available to the media for interviews uh, or for you to just exchange cards and do business. Thank you all very much.